Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the program. I'm Christiane Amanpour. What happens now that one of Europe's powerhouses, Spain, has been forced to take a bank bailout to the tune of $100 billion? It may be expensive, but this is an attempt to sp stabilize Spain ahead of what Europe is really worried about, and that's next week's Greek elections. My brief tonight, is the Spanish bailout enough to protect Europe against the worst-case scenario in Greece? If the leftist anti-austerity candidate Alexis Tsipras wins, Greece may well leave the Eurozone, and many economists see that as a frightening outcome. It's no secret that Greek voters are angry, and now people are angry also in Ireland and Portugal, because Spain does not have to meet as many draconian conditions as they did for their bailouts. Spain has already enacted tough austerity measures and reforms. People there are indignant, literally. The indignados are back on the streets. That's the Spanish protesters that spawned Occupy movements here in the United States and around the world. Unemployment in Spain is now a staggering 29%. Christine Lagarde, the managing director of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, is a crucial player in the European drama, and I'll speak with her in a moment. But first, a look at what's coming up later in the program. Sometimes we must interfere. So said Elie Wiesel when he accepted his Nobel Peace Prize. Now, 26 years later, I'll ask the man who survived the Nazi death camp is it time to interfere in Syria? And from those death camps to the massacres in Syria. You can see the blood splatter up the wall. It is unimaginable. Journalists, eyewitnesses on the front lines. How history repeats itself. We'll get to that in a bit, but first to my exclusive interview with Christine Lagarde. I sat down with her as she was working on Spain's bailout, and we talked about some of the worst-case scenarios for Europe. But she started out by outlining what she sees as Spain's must-do list. What's really important and probably lacking at the moment is the backstop. Backstop meaning, you know, a strong sense uh, that there will be enough always if more funds, more capital is needed to strengthen the system. There is a minority of the system that needs strengthening in order to address vulnerabilities, weaknesses of the system, uh, and, and that's really essentially our conclusion. Do you agree with George Soros' assessment that there's three months to save the euro? He's, George is, is very good at setting, you know, sort of deadlines and, and, uh, and attracting the attention, which is good because, the, uh, you know, there has to be attention paid to the current situation. But I think, you know, it needs to happen. Various things need to happen uh, shortly. Such as? Or what we've shortly, just been discussing? Shortly, yeah. <laughs> More shortly than three months, I would say. Mm. But it's not to say that there is a deadline and that the whole, you know, situation is going to unravel. I think the, you know, the construction of the Eurozone has taken time uh, and, and it's work in construction at the moment, and it keeps being improved and amended and, uh, and strengthened over time. Markets are finding it too slow, and, and clearly that's the message that uh, is being delivered. Do you think Greece is going to exit the euro? My, my hope is that uh, Greece, once it has resolved its current uh, election situation and has a government in place based on a coalition, I suppose, can actually uh, restore the conditions of a, a good dialogue and will implement the reforms and will put in place the measures that are necessary for that country to stay within the Eurozone. Do you think it's possible where they are right now? It's going to be a question of, of political determination and drive to actually do so. You've been asked about what is ailing Greece, and you've been asked to comment on the, the personal pain that many Greeks are feeling, uh, and you commented that, you know, from your point of view, it would be much better if the Greeks paid their taxes and that that would, that, would, that would fix things. Do you still stand by that? Let me put it that way. I have respect uh, for Greece, for the Greek population, and I'm very sorry that my comments were taken in a very, infl you know, in a very um, inflammatory way and, and created offence. That I very much regret. But equally, I think that tax compliance is a necessary tool to restore any country's situation 
Greece like others. There's a, the, the front page of The Economist is showing the ship of the economy, the ship of state of the economy sinking, you can see right there. Uh, and on it, it said, Mrs. Merkel, can we start the engines now? A lot of the onus is on Angela Merkel. Is that fair? Well, Germany is the largest country in the Eurozone uh, that, that has, uh, has been very successful because of the measures that had been taken because of the sacrifices made by uh, the German population to contain its, its, uh, its, its, its salaries and to improve productivity and to drive its economy through, through exports. So now a lot of the pressure is on Germany to actually um, help out. But I fully understand as well that Germany, in consideration for the help that it could give in starting the engine, uh, will expect that others are also doing you know, what they have to do. Do you think if Angela Merkel wasn't a woman, she would get this amount of pushback? <laughs> no. I think, uh, well, I think she's a very strong leader. Uh, she's a very courageous woman. Uh, she's, uh, she's always very keen to understand fully the situation. And, uh, and I think she has a very solid sense of balance you know it's a give and take process it's a two-way street and you know what's what's in it for the, for germany uh what's in it for others and how do we balance out the situation but you think she wouldn't be under such global attack if she wasn't a woman hmm. well germany is germany and the economic forces are the same but i think that there is a there is a slight tendency to actually uh, maybe over-dramatize and maybe the media participate in the process, uh, the, uh, the, the pressure under which uh, she is. And it's, it's you know, surprisingly and, and very practically a male-dominated world where she stands out. President Obama addressed the world. He did an appearance at the White House, talked about the economy and focused a lot on the crisis in Europe. Let's look at what he had to say. If uh, they are just cutting and cutting and cutting and their unemployment rate is going up and up and up, uh, and people are uh, pulling back further uh, from spending money because uh, they're feeling a lot of pressure. Ironically, that can actually uh, make it harder for them uh, to carry out some of these reforms over the long term. Do you agree? Countries cannot carry on growing, creating jobs, if they carry on their back a huge amount of public debt. So there is no doubt that public debt has to be gradually, over time, reduced. How do you reduce public debt? By having less deficit. How do you reduce deficit? By either having significant growth and therefore revenues or cutting spendings. And you probably need to do a combination of both in order to reduce deficit, which will reduce debt, which will allow in turn economies to, to grow and create jobs. Isn't it though about the timing and that when you do it? I mean, Paul Krugman, who mm. has been like a Cassandra, mm has actually seems to have got it right, that austerity should happen in boom times and not in bust times. And if we look at some of our graphs that we have, for instance, let's look at how austerity has affected the unemployment uh, mm -hmm. rate. If I do this, you'll see the unemployment rate has been quite low in 2008. What happened then? We had a recession. So it, mm -hmm. it rose right up to here until there was a recovery. And then unemployment sort of leveled off a little bit, and then this happened, austerity, mm -hmm. and this happened to the unemployment rate, mm -hmm. all the way mm -hmm. up again. Mm -hmm. What do you say to that, though? I mean, is it, it does Paul Krugman and, and, and the Keynesians, do they have a point? You need to reduce the fiscal deficit gradually, steadily, doesn't have to be this belt tightening that everybody's talking about, but it has to be solid. It applies to the United States of America, by the way. It also has to indicate how in the medium and long term it is going to reduce its deficit and reduce the volume of its debt. So that's what needs to happen. At the same time, there has to be encouragement for the growth. Is it about not having the funds or is it about not having the political mechanism and the political will to deal with this? Everybody has a skin in the game. Everybody has a stake in, in this being resolved because all the economies are vastly interconnected. That's what President Obama has indicated. There is a clear connection 
and vulnerability to what is happening elsewhere in the world, particularly when it's the Eurozone, which is a, a major trading partner. Christine Lagarde, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And from the economic crisis, we'll turn to Syria and the perspective of Nobel Prize winner Elie Wiesel. He was a child in the Nazi death camps of World War II. When we return, I will ask how long the world can allow the Syrian atrocities to continue.